Good morning. Thank you. Yikes. Are we awake? I guess not. Well, good thing for you. I got something interactive planned for the beginning of this service to wake you all up. So today is week three of the God of Real Life, and I get to preach, uh, bring the message to you today. Um, Pastor Clark did not feel well this week, so I got called in last minute. So I'm like, yay, I get to preach. I love it when I get to bring the message. So my topic for this week was family, or it is family. And so I started thinking about how I wanted to open the service, and I thought about family feud. How many of you remember family feud? All right, yeah. Now, I do want to say, I have been informed that Family Feud these days is a little more risque than back when I watched it. So we're not doing risque Family Feud, we're doing church Family Feud, okay? And again, we're not in a production studio, we're not in a game studio, so we we don't have anything fancy like that going on, okay? So here's how it's going to work. I'm going to give you the question. I'm going to need some audience participation for you to yell out some answers after we have acquired some answers. We will go through what's on the board one by one, because I can't, listen, I just can't figure it all out to click the answers as we go. All right, so are we ready? So we're talking about families today. So the question is, name the top reasons that family members annoy each other. Snoring. Whining. They're breathing. I feel like that's somewhere around snoring, but okay, they're awake and they're breathing. Arguing, complaining, one more. Te- <laughs> Just being a teenager. All right, let's see if any of your answers are on here, okay? Too many dad jokes. Oh, wah, 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 right? All right, talking too much. Oh, my notes are wrong, and I can't see because I have my glasses on. What's it say? Hitting snooze on the alarm. My notes aren't right. I don't have my glasses on. This is embarrassing. Okay, what's the next one? Is that on there? Okay. Wow, this has turned into a train wreck. It almost feels like I'm on the show. Okay, what's the next one? Not listening. That would fall under teenagers, right? Sorry, guys. I may or may not have been the one to list what annoys me in my house. And number one, losing the remote. Does anybody else, does that drive them nuts at their house? Yeah, yeah, my husband's raising his. It makes him almost lose his religion. Um, So anyways, we love our families though, right? but we'd all be liars if we said that they didn't annoy us too. But that's what we're talking about today is we're talking about families. And, you know, amid the annoyance, amid the arguing, hopefully there's some laughter and there's some tears maybe. Hopefully in the midst of all that, there is love um, at the end of the day. And, you know, our families were meant to be a reflection of God's love and grace. That's the purpose of the family unit. And when I'm talking about families, I'm talking about your biological family unit that you are a part of, but I'm also talking about the spiritual family that you're a part of when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And so the family unit was designed by God, all right? We all have a family unit, and it is a gift from God. It is supposed to be a gift from God. It is a place for us to belong. It gives us a point of heritage. It is supposed to be a true model of God's love to us in the family. And God's model for the family is for one man and one woman to come together as one, and that they would have children, and that they would raise their children to know and to fear the Lord. That is the biblical model of of what a family is to be. Now, I want to stop here because I want to acknowledge that while there are many of us in this room that that come from a healthy family, and maybe we come from that nuclear family of, of a mom and a dad together and married and 
leave it to beaver and father knows best. There are many of us that came from that background, but there's a lot of us in this room also who did not come from that healthy family background. There's a lot of us um, who their family did not feel like a gift to them, or it did not feel like a place of love to them, and they endured a lot of hardship. So I do want to, to acknowledge that. And, you know, part of the reason that we see this, again, is because of sin. We live in a broken world, and sin has just absolutely distorted every single thing that God created for us. And most of the time, we can see that become really apparent in our families and in our relationships with one another. And um, in our marriages, it just seems to, that brokenness just seems to come out in that. And so because of sin, because things have been broken, um, you know, families can look different. Families look very different from what God's intended plan was, but that doesn't mean that he's not still at work. And I also want to say, too, that just because you might have grown up in a Christian home or had Christian parents, that does not automatically equate to healthiness. Um, Oftentimes we say if we're Christian, then that means that we're healthy. And that's the ideal because we want to be Christ followers and we want to be healthy. But just because you are a Christian doesn't mean that your parents haven't hurt you or you haven't hurt your parents or siblings or other family members. If we're, if we're all really honest, we've all got some baggage from our family, right? Whether that's baggage that we've already dealt with, that we're going to deal with, or we're dealing with right now. And so the reality is that there's just simply no perfect family. Um, I myself come from divorced parents. My parents divorced when I was nine. They both went on to remarry, and now I have a wonderful extended step family on both sides. Uh, my husband comes from a broken family. Uh, he was, his mom went on to remarry. His dad was never really in the picture. So um, that has certainly shaped us and how we are today, that experience as kids. Um, we also found Jesus, both my husband and I, when we were 30 years old. We had been married for two years uh, when we both um, encountered Jesus and accepted him as our Lord and Savior. And so having that experience has also changed us and shaped us into who we are today. But again, you know, there are no perfect families. Um, if you open up the Bible to go look for your perfect family, come, come show me. Come show me, because when I was looking through, I'm like, I can relate to some of these people. Like, we've all got some dysfunction in our family. I mean, look at Adam and Eve. They were barely off the honeymoon before Eve disobeyed God and ate the forbidden fruit. And if you remember correctly, it sure didn't take Adam very long to back that bus up over her to, to blame her instead of taking accountability. Uh, they went on to have two sons, and uh, that was not a healthy relationship, and, and uh, one son murdered the other son. If you look at Abraham, uh, he was so afraid of Pharaoh that he lied about Sarah being his wife and said, no, that's not, that's not my wife, that's my sister. Ladies, can you imagine the audacity? I mean, imagine the betrayal there. And that's just the tip of the iceberg, you know? You look at um, Jacob. Jacob uh, stole his brother Esau's birthright by deceiving his dad. It put him and his brother at odds for a very long time. He then later on goes on to have his own family, and uh, he openly favors his son Joseph. And that favoritism breeds hatred between the other and jealousy between the other siblings, and they concoct a plan and pull it off to sell Joseph into slavery. Even if we look at Mary and Joseph, Jesus's earthly family, Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He was born of the Virgin Mary. But don't think for one second that the tongues weren't wagging around that situation. That was scandalous to people that, that Joseph would marry Mary, even though she was pregnant. And then I think about, for those of you that have siblings, you know how there's always that one sibling that never does anything wrong with the parents? Like, just think about that. Think about if you were Jesus' sibling. He didn't do anything wrong. Like, he never sinned. He never made a mistake. I just have a feeling that that caused that caused some tension. I just feel like it. Some of his brothers even struggled to believe that he was the Messiah. So 
there really is no perfect family. But yet time and time and time again in Scripture and the examples that we have, we see these families reflecting God's love and grace to us even today. And we can learn so much from them. And the one thing that they had um, in common is that they had faithfulness and a love of God. Every single one of these families, all of them that you could look at, there's plenty more. You could look at King David and all of them. They still loved God in the mess. They still sought him out in every circumstance, in the struggle and in the brokenness and in the mistakes. And um, their hearts just chased after God. And so I think that when we think about our family units. That's what we want our family to be. We want to be a family that chases after God's love and will reflect it. And I think that that's also one of the reasons that God gave us a family is because he gave us so many unlimited opportunities to reflect his love within our family, our immediate family, our extended family, our church family. And I don't know about you, but some of the most difficult people that I deal with are in my family. And I'm like, thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to practice and reflect your love. But when it comes to reflecting God's love, that means that the foundation that we build our family upon has to be Christ's example of love. And I know that this feels very basic and simple, but It is the foundation that we need. If we don't start with Christ's love, then we're not starting on a strong foundation. And this means regardless of what your family situation looks like, if you are a single person today, your foundation needs to be on Christ's love. If you are married with kids or without kids, your foundation needs to be on Christ's love. If you are divorced, you need to make that foundation on Christ's love. If you're a blended family, that's got to be your foundation. If you're a single parent struggling through raising kids on your own, the foundation you need is Christ's love. If you are widowed, that is the foundation that you need, regardless of, of what your specific context the family looks like, the foundation has got to be Christ's love because we don't exist on our own, okay? We're all part of a family unit, whether we like it or not. And if we can make the foundation of that family unit love, that love is going to go out and it's going to enrich others. It's going to touch people that we don't even realize. And it's going to transform not only ourselves and our lives, but our families. It can change the whole trajectory of your family. So in Corinthians, the Apostle Paul is writing a letter to them, and he talks about love. But I want to give you a little bit of context, because you've probably heard this verse that I'm going to share. A lot of people read it at their weddings and everything like that. But I want to give you the context surrounding it. So the church in Corinth, it was a hot mess and a half, okay? There was a lot going on. There was a lot of division among the church. Um, People were coming to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, but they were unwilling to like relinquish their love of the things of this world. And so that was causing a lot of problems. There was a lot of bickering and arguing about which spiritual gift was the best. It was getting so heated that people were actually wanting to sue one another in this church. I mean, can you imagine if we're sitting at Quest and the person in the section next to you is suing you or they're arguing with you about which gift is better? I mean, it was getting ugly. There was a lot of impatience and just a whole lot of all-around bad behavior happening at at Corinth, Corinth, the church in Corinth. And so Paul writes this letter, and he is trying to encourage them, and he's admonishing them, and he's trying to teach them how to get back to the basics and to get them on the right track. And he knows that love needs to be the foundation. It's got to be what everything else is flowing from. And so he says this. He says, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices. You know, my glasses with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Now, I'm guessing a lot of you have heard this verse. 
And I feel like this is one of those verses that we just kind of take for granted. We just read it, we, we see it, we've heard it before, maybe it was read at our wedding and that's totally fine. And we just kind of skim over it. But I mean, if you really take this verse and you sit in it and you really examine your life in contrast to it, it can be very convicting. And I'm one that used to just read this verse and kind of take it for granted. And this week I'm like, oh, I think I owe my husband an apology because I definitely have a record of wrongs going on. We get into an argument and I go historical. And so, you know, it can be very convicting. And so as I was, I was reading this and about what Paul says that love is, I'm like, this is what God wants our families to be. What if when we read this verse, we could say, my family is patient. My family is kind. My family does not envy and it does not boast and it is not proud. My family does not dishonor others and it is not self-seeking. My family is not easily angered and my family keeps no record of wrongs. My family does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. And my family will always protect, always trust, always hope, and always persevere. What if love was so ingrained in our family, and that was just the total foundation of it, that our families reflected that verse in our lives and our actions and other people were able to see that. And again, this applies not only to that immediate family, but our extended family, our church family, and really any relationship that we're in. This is the foundation of love that we want to build upon. And we're to love because God has loved us. Our Father in heaven showed us how much he loved us by sending his son to us. And the son, Jesus, showed how much he loves us by giving up of his life for us. And the Holy Spirit shows us how much he loves us today because he fills us with God's love for other people. And we are to love like that. If you look in the book of Ephesians chapter 5, it's going to give you a lot of instruction for Christian households. Now, I'm not doing a deep dive into this because I really feel like we could do like a whole sermon series on that. But I do want to pull out a couple verses on this, and I encourage you to go read it later on at, at your leisure. But Ephesians 5 verses 1 through 2 says, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. See, this is our goal, to follow God's example. And that word that we translate into follow in the original language, it means imitate. It means mimic. That's what we're called to do. We are called to imitate God's example. And I love the way that the message words this. The message says, watch what God does and then do it. Watch what God does and then do it. And do it like children who learn proper behavior from their parents. Mostly what God does is love you. Keep company with him and learn a life of love. Observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious but extravagant. He didn't love in order to get something from us, but to give everything of himself to us. Love like that. When we look to Jesus and we love as he loved, when we love our families as he loved, when we serve our families as he served, when we give to our families as he gave, we know then that we are loving in the way that we should be. And, you know, it talks about doing so like a, like a child learns from their, their parent. And the fact of the matter is, is that we learn from our parents good or bad. It's just the way that it is. I remember um, when I was pregnant with my, my firstborn, um, you know, obviously it was our first child. We hadn't been parents yet. And I can remember Paul and I talking about, you know, our dreams and our hopes and our fears. And I remember him sharing with me that he was so afraid that he wasn't going to be a good dad. And I'm like, why are you afraid that you're not going to be a good dad? And he's like, I didn't have a dad. My husband's father walked out when he was 18 months old, and he didn't really have a relationship with him. 
And he goes, how am I supposed to know how to raise my son if I wasn't even raised by a dad? How do I know if I'm going to be a good dad? I know all the things not to do. And basically, if I stick around for 18 months, I'm already doing better than my own dad did. And it broke my heart to see him struggle with that. But that was a real fear of his because we imitate what we know. And he wanted to be the best dad that he could be. And he is the best dad that he can be. But what I love about this, when we're, when we're advised and we're told to look at God and to imitate him and to do what he does, it's because it doesn't matter if you've had a good godly example of a father or a mother in your life. Even if you didn't have that, you have the example by your heavenly father. And you look to him and you follow in his footsteps because he is the one that loves us without abandon. He's never left us. And I, I think that that brought my husband comfort. I guess I didn't ask you that. But I think that that's comforting for us to realize that even if maybe we had a cruddy situation as a kid or parents, that we have a Father in heaven that we can look to. And then, you know, my hope is, is that one day my kids will grow up and they'll be able to look back and say, man, my mom and dad, they were godly examples for me. Because, I mean, think about that. Think about in your life who is a godly example to you. I can think of those people. And I didn't grow up in a Christian house, so my godly examples came later on in life. But that's our goal. And I think that if we model it, and then they imitate it, but even if it wasn't modeled for us, we can still imitate God, and we can pass that down. We want to follow God's example we want to walk in love, imitating Jesus and reflecting his love. So what exactly does that mean then? Well, it means that we have to spend time in prayer and conversation with God, not only with ourselves but also with our family. And, and I'm not talking about being legalistic and saying, and not that this is bad, I think that this is good, but it's not just about praying at meals and at bedtime. I'm all about looking for those organic moments that you can pray with your family members. My grandma, so my family on my dad's side, um, there's only, I think, three of us that are Christ followers. And so the rest of my family is not Christians. But I love every time I go to my dad's for holidays because my grandma is going to take every opportunity she can, and she'll be like, okay, gather around. We're going to pray now. Jesse, she's the only one that's allowed to call me Jesse. Jesse, will you pray? But I love that because even though my family are not believers and I'm not going to Bible thump them or anything, they know that we're going to do that time of prayer. And I look forward to that because I never know if in one of those moments God is going to give an opportunity to speak to my non-believing family members. You know, so again, it doesn't just apply if you have kids. If you are interacting with any of your family members, are you looking for organic moments to pray with them and to introduce them with that? My, my son, um, he left our house cell phone on the back of my husband's van a couple weeks ago. My husband didn't know, and it got run over, and we're out walking West Liberty at 10 o'clock at night looking for this phone to see if we can find it. And we were walking, and he's getting frustrated, and all of a sudden it dawned on me, hey, we should pray. And so as we're walking, Caleb is praying that God would help us find this phone, which I know sounds silly, but it was an organic moment. And uh, a half hour later, we found the phone. And he was like, oh, God heard that prayer and he answered it. So that's what I'm talking about. Like, look for those organic moments. Keep doing the praying with your kids, um, you know, before bedtime and meals with your extended family. Keep doing those prayers, but keep looking for the organic moments that you can invite people in to your prayer time. So the other way that we can reflect is we have to show grace and patience with our spouses, with our significant others, with our kids, with our parents, with our siblings. We have to show grace and patience in our relationships with people. And that is not to mean that there's not going to be conflict. There's not going to be, doesn't mean that there's not going to be hard conversations, but it means as we enter into them, we're going to do so with grace and patience. And we're going to strive to build people up in those conversations rather than tear them down. 
to imitate Jesus and reflect his love means that we've got to forgive. We've got to forgive and we've got to try to forget so that we can be healthy and we can move on. We forgive because we have been forgiven. We imitate Jesus and reflect his love by being the role model that I talk about. I talk about this with my kids all the time. Like, I don't know if it's sinking in yet, but I'm trying. I'm like, you are a role model to other people. And, and I just want to speak to men real quickly, um, specifically fathers. Please don't underestimate your role as the man in the household. Um, I tell my husband this all the time. His influence with our kids is far greater than mine, even though I may spend a lot of time with them. His influence is far greater than the influence that I wield. God has given you men to be the spiritual leaders of your family, and he's called you to be the role model for your kids, and they are watching everything that you fellas do. So please take that to heart and don't underestimate um, the influence that you have. And it's not just with them because you influence them and then they go out into the world and they're going to influence others. It's this ripple effect. And for all you fellas out there that one day will have kids, remember that. But we be a role model. As you imitate Jesus, then you are leading others in the way of imitating Christ themselves. You can imitate Jesus and reflect his love by being helpful. Are you helpful with your family? Are you, are you known to someone that's going to be there to, if they need you or if they need help? Um, that is another way that we can do that. What about being intentional with quality time with your family? Man, being intentional is so important. And again, it's not just the immediate family. It's that extended family. Like, I'm very intentional about making sure that my kids get to see their great-grandparents. You know, I want them to have that relationship with them. Um, I'm maybe not so good with the aunts and uncles, <laughs> you know, but are we being intentional about, about spending time with our family? And the last really big thing about imitating Jesus and reflecting his love means living sacrificially for each other. Are you willing to put the needs of someone else above your own? Because that's what that means. You know, in Ephesians 5.21, and this is before Paul breaks down the, the specific roles for each family member, but he starts out with this. He says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to one another. And I know we don't like to hear that word submit, but what this means is if you're putting me above you and looking out for me, and I'm putting you above me and looking out for you, what's going to happen? Both of our needs are going to be taken care of. Can you imagine what your entire family unit would look like if every single person viewed the other people as more important than themselves? Like, I'm imagining that in my house. Like, I wouldn't have to ask anybody to do dishes. I wouldn't have to ask anybody to do laundry. Nobody would have to ask me to pack their lunch because they know I'd already done it. Like, we're all looking out and elevating someone is more important than ourselves when we live sacrificially. And God designed it that way so that everybody's needs would be taken care of. But that means putting others above ourselves and it going both ways. Our family gives us unlimited opportunities to reflect God's love. I'm going to invite the worship team to, to come on up. And I want you to think about this and to think about your family. Whatever your personal context is, whatever your family looks like. Um, I want you to think about that because the way that you live your life in your biological family and in your spiritual family is a testimony to God's love in the world. And I don't want you to forget how powerful that testimony is. Oftentimes our family units are used to progress the gospel into the world. And again, like I said earlier, building your foundation on Christ's love, living sacrificially, imitating him, it can absolutely change the trajectory of your family and the legacy that you leave behind. So are you living out God's love in your family as a single person, as a married person, as a parent, whatever your context, are you living out God's love in your circle? 
starts with that relationship with Jesus. It starts with that foundation of love. So this week, I want you to look for ways that you can reflect God's love in your family because he's giving you a whole lot of opportunities to do so. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, I just thank you. I thank you for all of our families. I thank you um, that you give us these family units to be a part of and, and to um, learn to love the way that you love us. Lord, I just pray that you would come into each of our families and that you would lead us and guide us, that you would help us navigate the relationships in a way that is honoring to you. I pray that our families would begin to embody the words in 1 Corinthians, Lord, that, that our families would just take hold of that and just be a living testament to that definition of love. Lord, I thank you for each of these people here today. I thank you for all of their families. I thank you for the ways that I know that you are going to go out and work in them and through them. And I give you all the glory and all the praise. Let's worship together. Throughout my history Faithfulness as you walk beside me. When the storm made way for spring, and every season from where I stand, I see the evidence of your goodness.
My blessing for you as you go out this week is may you see the evidence of God in your families this week. May you go out and reflect Christ's love in your family and to all those you encounter. Go in peace.